I uh, am the chair of the Historical Commission, but in, in addition to that, I'm also a prospect Hill Park steward um, in conjunction with the Waltham Land Trust. And prospect Hill Park stewards um, help out uh, the rec department and the rec board um, in, in sort of their eyes and ears in the park. And so um, at times, uh, I've gone around and picked up trash. Um, I've tried to uh, get invasives out of the park and so on and so forth. Um, and also helped uh, lost tourists in the park. Believe it or not, there are from time to time uh, tourists who are on the trails and don't know where they are. Um, anyway, in doing that, I ran across these old stone walls, which I didn't know what they were or why they were doing there in the middle of the hill. And so I started researching that and looking into it, um, and it's turned into a big project for the Historical Commission. And if you go to the Commission's website, then you can get a lot more information from that. But what I found was that, in fact, Prospect Hill Park um, has a very deep history. In fact, it goes back to the first few years of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, the beginning of, of European settlement in this area. Um, and so I'd like to share some of that with you. But before I go on, this is the first of what we hope were three talks through the summer um, looking at different aspects of Prospect Hill Park. So I'm talking about the historical aspect. Linda is going to be talking um, insects. on, on <laughs> insects um, in July. In July. What, what date is that? July 13th. July 13th. So put that on your calendar too. And then we're hoping to have a talk on the plants. And, and, Leslie will do that maybe uh, September, but she might wait till next year. So we're not sure. We yet. But anyway, next month there's another talk of this and walk. So, okay, so let's uh, begin. Um, as I say, the history goes back uh, a long time. Um, in 1631, uh, and remember that in fact, um, Boston, the Puritans, founded Boston, Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630. At the same time, there were a number of other towns nearby that were founded that same year, 1630. Watertown was one of those. Waltham was a part of Watertown until 1738. So our history goes back then, um, really, to, to the beginning of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, in 1631, Governor Winthrop uh, and his son, um, and a number of others from Boston came up uh, the Charles River exploring the interior. Um, nobody knew really what was, what was here. This is the first time that it got explored. Um, and, and they stopped in, in a number of places in Waltham. They didn't get to Prospect Hill. Uh, but interestingly, they got to a place called Boston Rock. Um, and it turns out there have been many Boston Rocks in Waltham. <laughs> um, this one, I believe, um, is where what's left of the castle is on the Brandeis University campus. Um, there's another Boston Rock that I've seen on maps on, on, on Mount Feek in the cemetery. Um, and of course, on Prospect Hill, there's an outcropping that's called Boston Rock also, but that's not the one that Winthrop was on. But he was in the area, he named things like Beaver Brook um, and Mount Feek uh, at those times. So those names actually go back to 1631. Now, um, originally Watertown um, was much larger than it is today. Uh, here's Watertown, it included uh, Belmont, uh, actually starting from about the Mount Auburn Cemetery area, um, and, and uh, stretched through Waltham, up through Lincoln, even into uh, Concord up here, and down, including Weston, down to the Wellesley, what's currently the Wellesley line. So, so this was all, that's the Charles River there. This was all the original, it's from the 1630s, uh, town, colonial town of Watertown, including, as I say, Waltham, here in the middle. Now, in 1636, the, the, the original settlers of Watertown decided that the, there were too many uh, newcomers coming into the town, <laughs> and, and that they wanted to preserve the land for their descendants. And so they gave themselves land grants, uh, divided up. Most colonial towns had most of the land in common, whereas Wal Watertown was an exception. And it gave out most of its land to private owners um, as private property. And the first of those land grants was called the Great Dividends Land Grant. 
And that's shown in this red here. It consisted of three strips, one, two, three, four, uh, four strips rather, um, each strip about five miles long, parallel to what's now the Lexington Waltham border, um, and a half a mile wide, each strip being a half a mile wide, and having about 30 lots, 30 individual lots of each strip, the first 120 settlers. Uh, at least the first 120 settlers who were members of the church and bigwigs and so on and so forth. Um, and in fact, that led to problems and there were later on land grants to make up for the fact that other people got left out and so on. So a lot of politics as usual. Um, so I bring this up is that in fact, Prospect Hill Park is right down um, somewhere here at, near that lower one. By the way, this is Stony Brook here. Um, this is Beaver Brook here. An idea on, on the map. Um, this may give you a, a more interesting view. This is an actual map from 1720. Uh, now, I took a picture of a copy of it, but, but it was an original map from 1720. Uh, Weston broke off from Watertown in 1713, I believe it was. So Weston was already gone here. So the border now is Stony Brook here. Um, and this map dates from the time when Watertown was split into two church congregations. Beforehand, it had been one single meeting house that everybody had to go to. Um, and so it was very inconvenient for people out here in the Waltham area. And so in 1720, they divided into two. And that's what this map is from. Um, uh, I think there's some very interesting features here. First of all, um, some of the old roads. So 1720, these roads that we still drive on existed. So here is Main Street and Weston Street. Eventually, that became part of the Boston Post Road. Um, but in fact, it was an old Indian trail from even before European settlement. So when you get stuck in traffic on Main Street, <laughs> think about that. It's very historic. So, so some other streets here that, that uh, we, we drive on today, Trapello or Trapello Road uh, up here. Um, this is Beaver Street here. This is Pleasant Street. Now, Pleasant Street is a very short street um, opposite Newton Street, the eastern part of the town. Um, but in, in colonial days, it actually came up um, to, to meet Beaver Street around where the Lyman estate is, the circle uh, on Lyman Street. Um, further out, this was Lincoln and, West, and, and Winter Streets here. And this was College Farm Road. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that was one of the main roads at, at one time. Notice no Lexington Street and so forth uh, at that time. And also South Street being down here. And then is that 117, that little spur there? Uh, that was 117. Like, see, no, down by Weston Street? No, no, no. This is actually going into Prospect Hill Park. Oh, okay. Or, or just right. the beginning because okay. there were some farms right. down here. Okay. Um, this is for splitting up, uh, is trying to equalize the split up in the two congregations. And so it's very important because it shows actually where people lived uh, at that time. Yeah. And so that so you can see there were a couple houses down here <coughs> in, in that area. Okay. Anyway, what I wanted to point out here were these parallel lines. Those are those squadron lines. Those are the lines that divided these land grant strips. Were called the strips were called squadrons, and the lines behind dividing them were called squadron lines. Um, and so here we have lines that were drawn in, in, 17, in 1636. Nobody had a map of the area. So it was an imaginary map, imaginary lines drawn on an imaginary map. Those lines still govern many of our property lines and streets to this day. So, OK, this is a map now of Waltham in 1738. It was drawn in 1935 by Edmund L. Anderson, who was an eminent local historian. Um, and, and he actually plotted out where all the original land grants were. Um, and so these are the great dividend land grants. And, and you can see a job here in the lines. They're not in straight lines anymore because there was a big meadow down here. And the meadow was kept as common land. Um, so they jogged everything to accommodate uh, that. Um, you'll also notice down here, these were a, a land grant that was made in 1638. Um, and that land grant was called in lieu of township, or land in lieu of township grants. That was making up for, to some of the people who didn't get grants earlier in different places and so on. Um, <clears throat> same idea of, of these parallel lines of lots uh, divided by squadron lines. 
Now, the reason I bring this up for us is that here is Prospect Hill Park. You can see the two peaks here and here. Um, and so the dividing line between the two land grants, that squadron line comes right between. There's a wall there to this day showing that. Okay, this is um, a, a map. Uh, I don't know if you can see there are orange lines here. Those orange lines on the map uh, are, in fact, stone walls um, from an aerial survey done a few years ago. Um, those stone walls, if you look carefully, actually line up again, either parallel to or perpendicular to the Lexington border. Those are from land grants. These uh, maps are on the city website. Yes. Yeah, yeah. good point. Marie points out that, that a lot of the maps I'm showing here you can get from the Historical Commission um, website, which is uh, through the, on the website of the, the city's website. Um, okay, so now looking in closer to Prospect Hill, um, here is Prospect Hill, the big prospect, the little prospect. Um, here is Winter Street. Uh, so this is from 1738. Again, here is uh, Weston Street down here, Main and Weston Street. Um, and notice this road going across here, 1738. Um, that's actually now the Park Road. And we'll come back to that, but it, ex it was put through in 1731. Um, so it's a very, very old road. In fact, I also want to draw your attention to this land grant right here, this rectangle. This rectangle was given in 1636 to a guy named John Barnard. Um, and in fact, we'll come back to that because that's a main uh, grant in the middle of the park and one walls of which are on all four sides we can see in the park today. So, so we'll come back uh, to that land grant. Um, okay, now, uh, looking at some of these stone walls. Um, uh, first of all, so, so this is that John Barnard grant right here. Um, and in fact, those maps that we passed around, you should be able to find it on it. The orange lines here are the existing stone walls um, in, in the park. Most of them from these original 1636 and 1638 land grants. Um, this picture here is standing at this point right here and looking south along the line that divided the Barnard lot from the neighboring lot over here down to this wall here. Now this wall is interesting because that wall was built in 1734, because in that year, James Barnard, who was a descendant of John Barnard and owned the whole lot, sold off the northern third of it to a guy named George Harrington. And so this is a dividing line between the Barnard and Harrington lots. Um, and that wall still exists. So now we're looking down um, this wall here. Uh, at the Bernard Harrington Wall, and there's the Bernard Harrington Wall there. And that's right near the lean-tos in the park that we'll visit later on this wall. I thought it might be interesting for you to see a copy of the actual deed that deeded that portion from 1734. Um, and I'm not going to read all of it. It's hard enough for me to read by myself with, with the old script. But, but I just want to point here we have James Barnard here. Uh, here we have George Harrington uh, down here. You might be able to sort of make out uh, some of the words. And down here we have um, land uh, contained a lot or tract of land called dividend land. So this is re going back to those original 1636 dividend land, great dividend land grants. Um, and down here it says lying uh, on an hill called and known by the name of Prospect Hill. So way back in 1734, they were still talking about the name it Prospect Hill. Yes? Why is it called dividend land? That's what they called the, the, the land grant. I don't know why. Um, um, and, 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 uh, and down here it says uh, uh, Prospect Hill, and then it says, um, southerly and northerly and southerly by the squadron lines. So again, they were still dealing with those original squadron lines a hundred years later. 
Uh, I thought you might find this interesting. This is the end of the deed where they date it. Um, and it says, um, the second day of January, and I'm going to need, um, one, that's 1,733 four. Um, uh, and in the, the, the fourth year, I think, uh, of the reign of our sovereign lord, George II, King of Great Britain. So, real colonial history uh, back here. Now, what's this 33-4? Well, before the 1750s, dates in New England were by the Julian calendar. And the, first, and, and the year started in the end of March in the Julian calendar. And so, very often there was confusion of what was going on, and so very often they would do something like this date at 3-4. So it was dividing between 3 and 1733 and 1734. Okay, uh, now let's look at this wall. It doesn't look terribly impressive, and most of the walls in the park don't. They're basically alignments of, of stones, one or two stone high. Now, fairly large stones, but still stones. And so it pays to say a few words about the role of stone walls in colonial history. Um, many times stone walls were used to, to keep cattle um, and livestock out of plowed fields where they would eat the grain and so on and so forth. And those walls were more substantial to keep the cows out. Prospect Hill was always used for woodlots. Only the southern part, the very southern part, um, had anything to do with agriculture as we think of it. Um, and so they didn't need to have a big wall in order to do that. Another use of, of stone walls was to keep cattle in pastures. Um, but again, it wasn't used for pasture land. It was too hilly, not enough greenery growing there. And so um, we didn't need big walls for that. Another use was for plowed land, they used to take the stones that they ran across while trying to plow and move them to the side of the field. And that ultimately formed a wall along there. Well, they weren't plowing these fields. They were woodlots. They didn't need to move the stones. Um, and the last one is property boundary marking. And so that's what we see here. These walls were property boundary markers, and they always were property boundary markers. Um, so what uh, were the land, was the land used for? It was used for woodlots. For us today, that doesn't sound very important. Then it was very important because, of course, all the houses were built uh, out of lumber, and, and they were built in a form with these very thick posts and beams, which you can see here in this picture. Um, and, and those posts and beams couldn't be moved very far from where they were harvested to where they were being used. Um, and so you needed a local supply of lumber for that. You also needed a local supply of lumber, of course, for heating and cooking. Um, and, and, so, uh, and this was true up until uh, the mid-1800s when, when um, sawn lumber, two-by-four construction, came in uh, and wiped out post and beam construction. Um, and also uh, coal came in for heating and cooking. And so, in fact, when the city bought parkland uh, for the park, they were able to get it quite cheaply because the landowners didn't need it anymore for, for lumber. Um, so this is the 1800s. Here's a picture of, of uh, taking down trees. The trees were not clear cut on Prospect Hill, uh, but they were selectively cut for what they needed. Um, and then. The, the beams were hewn, the posts and beams were hewn, hand hewn from that. Um, and then uh, this is a picture of a barn raising in the 1800s. Um, this house here, which some of you may recognize, is the Hale Banks house. Um, uh, General Banks, oops. Banks. Um, uh, was a general in the Civil War. He was a governor of Massachusetts um, in, in his middle years. He, he bought this house that came from the Hale family, uh, who was a farming family before it. And we have an eyewitness account in, in the 1840s uh, of them harvesting logs on, on Bear Hill, now not Prospect Hill, but the neighboring Bear Hill, uh, to be used in a barn uh, for this house. So they often did it in winter so they could slide the stuff easily over the snow. Um, uh, so, uh, and now, the, the final thing I wanted to do with this map is show you this line down here. Um, that's the squadron line that divides the great dividend land grants north here 
from the Amu of Township lots down here uh, in the south. Um, and, and we will, in fact, uh, see a picture of that in a minute here, but I wanted to point out um, that that is on, uh, crosses the ridge trail between Little Prospect and Big Prospect. So that's a trail that many people use, uh, walk down the stone step stairs, and the next time you do, keep your eyes open. This is walking down from Little Prospect going north towards Big Prospect. The valley is down here, the valley shelter over here. Um, and here is that line of rocks yeah. going across, mm -hmm. which denotes this very historic line from 1636. Now, I might say the, the, the actual accurate surveying of these lots um, was not done until eight, uh, 1670 um, because there were political complications, as usual, and, and they actually had to bring in surveyors from out other towns to do an accurate survey job. So it wouldn't be polluted by the political process within the town itself. Um, and and, and uh, so, so the, the walls may date from 1670, but that still makes them 350 years old. So um, This is looking along that line of, of stones, along that squadron line, and you can see here the park road down here. So a very beautiful place in the park. And I encourage you to all keep your eyes open for these rows of stones going across, and then you can look at my report on the commission website and see what, what they're all about. Uh, okay, so originally the park was formed in, in, in 1893. In 1899, uh, topo map was drawn, and you can see each of these white lines uh, is, is straight white lines is a stone wall that existed in the park. Stones started disappearing from the walls. Um, people were using them for building rubble stone foundations, field stone foundations, and so on. And the park commission at the time uh, was, was yelling and screaming about this. So some of the stone walls were lost to that. Many of them were disturbed in the early 1900s when there was an infestation of moths. You might be interested in this. <laughs> and, and, and so they actually, I guess the moths were nesting in the walls or something. But they gypsy had gypsy moths, I bet. Uh, brown tail no, moths. Okay. Um, they had gypsy moths other, later on, but these were brown tail moths, I think. Anyway, um, so, so today, this is an aerial survey. It doesn't show all the walls that are there. Your map that we gave you is much more accurate. Um, but many of the walls have, have disappeared uh, since then. Okay, one other historical artifact here from colonial times, and that, as I mentioned, is the road that goes through the park. Um, that road was first laid out in 1731. There are notes in the town records um, that actually talk about this, that give the exact position of this road, going from one person's property to another, hitting a stone wall and going along the stone wall. So we know that by 1731, those stone walls were there up in the park for sure. Um, anyway, this road was put in um, in order to give farmers uh, up here uh, access to uh, Main Street, which was the Boston Post Road, the main road into Boston, um, and also uh, access to, to the woodlots uh, up here in the hill. Um, it is still the park road um, for most of the southern part coming up to this point here. You'll notice on this map at this point here, it goes straight along the colonial boundary, property boundary, and then out the squadron line. That is still um, Prospect Hill Lane. Um, on the west side uh, of Prospect Hill Park, um, you know, going into these office parks here and so on. Um, and, but when the, uh, the, the, the city bought this part of the park, they put the park road in through here. We'll talk about that later. In the early 1800s, um, it, it was revitalized as a stagecoach route. Um, and the stagecoach that went from Boston to Lancaster, Massachusetts, and then in Lancaster, you could switch to other coaches that went west, say, to Albany and so on. Um, that stagecoach stopped in Waltham, um, and it followed this route through the park. Um, so here's a picture uh, of what that stagecoach might have looked like, a uh, Concord court coach. This is actually a later time. This is in the later 1800s, um, when there was still a, a stagecoach that ran from Waltham to Lincoln. Um, and so this is an actual picture in Waltham of a stagecoach. And this building behind is the Central House, which was a big uh, inn um, in the heyday of stagecoaches, sort of stagecoach stops, um, and stands where the, Boston, where the Waltham Public Library 
now stands. Okay, this is looking at that stagecoach road um, at the southern end of the park. This is the southern gate to the park. Notice these two stone pillars. They were built in the late 1890s. Um, and notice the, the conveyance here, the, uh, the nice horse buggy. Um, this is what those gate, that gate looks like today. Um, same stone pillars from the late 1800s, although the transportation has changed. <laughs> And then this is what the stagecoach road looks like today um, at the southern end of the park. Now, um, I tried to find the oldest picture I could find um, of the park. And the oldest picture I ran across was this one, which is the background, uh, actually, for a picture of the early textile mill in, in Waltham. So this is the Boston Manufacturing Company, first textile mill. Um, it was built in 1814, that's Francis Cabot Lowell um, built that mill. It was the first textile mill, cotton mill in the country to have both water-powered spinning and water-powered weaving um, in one place um, by automated machinery. Um, it was also the first mill in the country to be built with brick, as I understand, and the first mill in the country to be based on modern corporate structure so that there was enough capital to keep up to date in the mill. And this, this mill actually did kickstart the American Industrial Revolution. So we have an extremely historic artifact here. And, and, and so next time you're driving on Moody Street and going south over the bridge uh, on the river, look off to your left. And that part of the Francis Cabot Lowell housing um, is, in fact, uh, the original mill back here from, from 1814, an extremely historic. Uh, so anyway, um, skip too far, too fast. That wasn't it. No, I just did something. <laughs> Um, if we look at, at uh, the hill, you'll notice that mostly these are deciduous trees. Um, and so back early in the 1800s, it was mostly deciduous. There were some nice pine trees there too, mostly deciduous. Most of them have been replaced since then because they were lost to insect damage, to fires, um, or to storms, primarily. Okay, um, in the 1800s, uh, the park, or, or Prospect Hill before it was a park, was really appreciated for its beauty um, and, and biology. And so um, this woman here is Sarah Alden Bradford Ripley. Um, she was a descendant of Alden and Bradford families from Plymouth, from the Pilgrims. Um, she was at this time the wife of Samuel Ripley, who was the minister uh, in Waltham. And Samuel was actually the uncle of, of, of Ralph Waldo Emerson. In fact, he came many times to, to, to Waltham to visit. Um, anyway, Sarah was an extremely brilliant uh, woman. Um, and in fact, there was a president of Harvard uh, at the time who said that if she had been a man, then she could have been the president of Harvard, basically. Um, but uh, so, and she was also a, a great uh, uh, botanist. And, and so led many expeditions from where she lived on Pleasant Street, which was near the meeting house, uh, and walked all the way to Prospect Hill, and then up around the hill, and then back to, to her home on Pleasant Street. Um, this is a quote from a book uh, by Joan Goodwin, the biography of her, Remarkable Mrs. Ripley. Um, and it's talking about a letter that, that um, Sarah Ripley wrote to this guy, George Simmons, who was a later clergyman here in Waltham, um, when he was abroad. And so she wrote him a letter, and here's what she said. One thing Sarah talked about with George, as if he were there, was her enthusiasm for lichens. The very day he left, had a visit from another amateur bot botanist, John Lewis Russell. And the next day, the two of them set out for Prospect on a gathering expedition. 
Sarah was delighted when Russell followed her to the top of the hill, his eyes searching the ground for mosses and suddenly looking up without expecting it, saw the extensive view which we used to look at last winter and exclaimed with admiration enough to satisfy any lover of Waltham and its beauties. <laughs> So this is the house that, that uh, Sarah Ripley lived in. This is the, the Ripley Parsonage. Um, uh, this picture is from 1890. That house still exists on Pleasant Street. Um, so uh, looking at the views from the summit, uh, we have this view here, which is the, uh, the archive of the Waltham Historical Society. Um, and this view is from 1898. Um, and I'm not sure whether this is Little Prospect or Big Prospect Summit. Honest with you, things have changed up there. Uh, but I did want to point out the, the attire uh, of, of the, uh, the women here, uh, because this is a similar kind of view here. Uh, so the view, of course, has changed in some ways too. We now have Boston on the skyline there. Um, this is uh, First Parish steeple here. This is St. Mary's steeple here. Um, and as you can see, uh, women's attire has changed some. <laughs> Uh, nobody can talk about the history in the 1800s of Prospect Hill Park without mentioning the hermit of Prospect Hill Park. Now, usually hermits are very reclusive uh, people. In fact, this hermit of Prospect Hill Park, uh, a guy by the name of Asa Fitz, who we see here, um, was in fact very hospitable, and he liked people coming up to visit him. <laughs> Asa Fitz was an extremely well-known uh, early music educator. He wrote many, many books for teaching children singing in schools and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, um, here is a copy of one of his books that we actually found in the Waltham Historical Society collection. Um, and, and from this one from 1859. Anyway, the last two years of his life, he decided to retire um, and, and seek the peace and quiet of Prospect Hill and, and its beauties. Um, and so he moved, this was his hermitage, uh, on Prospect Hill. This comes from a book published in, in, in 1879. Um, and and um, so you can see it's a fairly substantial house. Uh, these retaining walls. It's not clear at all where this existed on Prospect Hill. Um, I haven't been able to exactly pinpoint it yet, but there are some hints. Um, when the city bought property for the park in 1893, one of the lots they bought was this lot here from Charles Fitz. It turns out Charles Fitz was Asa Fitz's son. Um, and notice this lot here straddles what we now know as Boston Rock Path, um, coming up from the wood path down here, which then was called the Wood Road. Um, it turns out that, that Charles bought that lot three weeks after Asa, his father, died, um, which is sort of curious. Um, but he didn't buy it from his father's estate. He bought it from a single woman who lived in Boston who had bought it the same time as Asa Fitz moved to, to, to the hill. Um, so we're not sure exactly of what the connections are, but it's possible um, <laughs> that somewhere along here uh, is, is the site of the old hermitage. I've looked for this, this I'm standing here on, uh, I mean, these are hard to see, I'm sorry. I'm standing here on, on um, Boston Rock Path and looking out um, as I'm going up to the right. And there is, in fact, uh, a retaining wall, an old retaining wall here. This tree is growing right up through it. Um, and, and I can't figure out from any old maps what that, that retaining wall has to do with. So I've walked along it. And back in the woods there, there are a bunch, there's a series of retaining walls that are back there. But so far, I haven't been able to find a house foundation back there. So maybe that's where the hermitage was. So if anybody ever finds out, let me know. Okay, towards the end of the 1800s, many people started worrying about the loss of open space around the Boston area. Um, and one of those people was named Charles Eliot, um, who was a protege uh, of Frederick Law Olmsted, who you probably recognize the name, the famous landscape architect who did uh, Boston's Emerald Necklace, who did Central Park in New York, and also the landscape for our own Payne Estate here in Waltham. Um, anyway, um, Charles Eliot, in, in 1890, wrote a letter to the Garden Forest magazine, which was very prestigious, 
at the time. Um, and he proposed the immediate preservation of special bits of scenery still remaining within 10 miles of the State House, which possess uncommon beauty and more than useful, refreshing power. And so, sort of as a result of that, the Metropolitan Parks Commission was formed, and ultimately also the Trustees of Reservation um, at, at around the same time. And he was responsible, instrumental in both of those uh, organizations. Anyway, the park. Uh, board Commission then did buy up a number of parks around Boston here. So here we have Blue Hills Reservation down here. Here we have Middlesex Fells Reservation up here. Here we have Waltham. And there's nothing there in Waltham. And the reason for that is because Waltham took the initiative. In fact, didn't wait for the state to buy property, but in fact bought Prospect Hill itself. Elliot had recommended that Prospect Hill and Bear Hill both be included um, in, in that ring of parkland, but the state um, got a step on, on, on the, 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 rather the city got a step on the state and, and first and bought the land first. Uh, so that was in 1893. So the park began in 1893. I don't have an 1893 map of it. The oldest map I could find was, was 1897 here. So this is an 1897 map of, of Waltham. Um, and, and by 1897, so the, the park had grown to 125 acres. It started out at 75 acres, um, including both peaks in the park. So this is what it looked like. This is Winter Street up here. Notice no Totten Pond Road yet, of course. And, and this is... Um, uh, down here, Main Street, uh, down here. That's the, the railroad, the Central Mass Railroad. Down there. Um, notice that the parcels that were acquired during that period, some of these names should look familiar, Bond, Buttrick, Fitz, Hastings, Richard, well, Richardson anyway, those are trail names in the park. And so it's possible that that's the source of those trail names in the park. Um, okay, so some views of the park back at that period. This is a photograph that was taken in 1893 by Edmund Sanderson. Um, he was standing above Lincoln Street and looking towards the park. So here we see Lincoln Street here. Uh, notice, this is all farmland. This is where the lanes are now with all the houses that are on the lanes. And at that time, it was all farmland. Um, this is 109 Lincoln Street here. This is 111. Lincoln Street here. Those were houses that belonged to the Sanderson family. Um, 109 goes back to 17, uh, I knew I'd forget the date, something like 1787, 1780s sometime. Um, and, and 111 goes back to, to 1816, I believe it is. Um, so these were saying the house in between has since gone, the connection between the two. Um, this barn belonged to the Sandersons. It burned sometime in the early 1900s. But notice this odd-shaped building here. Um, that's not a flying saucer. That's actually an ice house. Because Totten's Pond existed at that time, and Totten's Pond was an ice pond. It was an artificial pond that was formed by damming the west branch of, of, Ch of, of Chester Brook. Um, and and uh, you could see, just barely see the pond back here behind the barn and, and the houses. Um, here is another look at that ice house. This house, you can see here, they're harvesting the ice crosshatch pattern on the ice field here. This is in the late 1800s. There was no electricity, basically, no electric refrigerators, no freezers, no anything. And so they, they harvested these ice box blocks, stored them here in sawdust uh, until the summer, uh, and then exported them, some of them international. It was a huge business in the end of the 1800s, and so that's what Totten's Pond was all about. Okay, here's another view from by Sanderson um, across, in 1920, uh, across the way to the summit of Prospect Hill Park, uh, and what I want to point out, these two are big pine trees gone in the hurricane of, of 1938. Um, this is a fire tower. Um, and so between 1917 and 1963, there used to be a fire tower on the summit, in the, a big prospect. Um, and so this is a picture here by Walter Starbuck, who is also another very um, important early historian in the city. Um, from 1932, this is what the fire tower looked like. It was open to the public. 
So people have to go up to the top and look around. This is a picture taken from the top of the fire tower. This is a shadow of the fire tower here. Uh, and it's looking north along the ridge trail to this stone um, viaduct here, which still exists on the ridge trail. So if you're hiking that stretch. Uh, now that probably came uh, from the Great Depression. And we'll talk about that momentarily. Um, in 1963, that big fire tower was taken down uh, to make room for this, which is not a radar set, but in fact a radio observatory, a radio telescope. Um, and it was used by the Air Force uh, for looking um, at, mainly it was used for, for looking at the sun, for looking at <laughs> sunspots and other solar storms. Um, as I said in my publicity for this talk, this is from colonial times to the space age. Well, here we are in the space age. Um, this was a time of uh, the, the Apollo push and so on to get to the moon. Um, and I remind you, this year is the 50th anniversary right, of landing on the moon. Well, this was part of Waltham's contribution to that effort. Uh, solar storms caused interference with communication with spacecraft. Solar storms. Uh, caused problems with, with uh, for the astronauts themselves, as far as health issues go. Um, and so uh, it was very important uh, to study those sunspots. It, it also functioned uh, uh, as, as a way of, of improving um, radio uh, observations, radio, radio telescope use. Uh, so that was done up there on, on Prospect Hill, too. And it was also part of the communication systems for satellites and spacecraft. Um, so a very important part of, of our early um, space effort. Uh, now, in, in, at the time that the big fire tower was taken down, um, a smaller fire tower was put up on, on Little Prospect. And I know it was there when I first came to town in the mid-1990s. Uh, um, and, and so that smaller tower um, accumulated a bunch of whip antennas on the top of it from local amateur radio uh, clubs and also for municipal communications uh, needs, needs, municipal services. Um, when that fire tower was taken down, um, and I think it was something like around 2000, the small fire tower, when, when that was taken down, those whip antennas were moved back to the pedestal of the, 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 um, the, the, this telescope here, the radio telescope. The dish was removed. Uh, around 1993, okay? But the pedestal, the thing that supported it was not. And so that's still on the summit of, of Big Prospect. Uh, one thing that many people may not notice, though, is on the other side of it is this accumulation of sticks here. Mm -hmm. That accumulation of sticks is a raven's nest. And I actually have seen ravens on that nest. I haven't seen them this year, although I have seen ravens in the park this year. Um, so, so they are around. So if you see a big, big black bird um, with a diamond-shaped tail, but it flies, that's a raven. You know, so keep that in mind. I don't know. Has anybody seen them nesting there this year? This year, I haven't. I, no? okay. uh, several years ago, I saw birds there. Yeah, but not, in the past several years, I haven't yeah. seen them. Okay, well this, talking about the space age, this is not a flying saucer. Uh, <laughs> although it is an alien intrusion into the park. Um, <laughs> Uh, this, is, this is a water tank, one of two, that were put up near the summit of Big Prospect in 1975 in order to make sure that Waltham had good water pressure throughout the, the city. Um, unfortunately, and, and I might say that, that, in fact, where one of these tanks was placed, any, at least, was, was a, a, a gravel pit that the city had been using at one time for graveling the roads and so on. So it wasn't pure nature when, when they put it in. But they did, the city did get into trouble with, with the state um, because they didn't um, get permission from the state legislature to use parkland for non-park purposes, which you have to do. Um, and so this came back to bite the, the city uh, later on, and I'll, I'll hopefully get to mention that. OK, so now going back to the development of the park, um, in 1912, um, uh, a lot, oops, pointer here is honking out, there we go, 1912. So this portion here was added to the park at, at the northeast corner of the park, a large addition. Um, this was called the Worcester uh, lot here, uh, and there was a beautiful stand of pine trees here 
uh, at this uh, portion uh, of the lot. Um, uh, over a hundred very large, mature, old growth pine trees. Almost all of them were wiped out in the hurricane of 1938. And so they're no longer there. Uh, but um, uh, there were also a lot of younger pine trees making a beautiful uh, grove. So this picture is actually from about 1900, again from the Historical Society archive. Um, notice the, the picnickers down here. Um, and, and this is what it looks like today. So it's still an extremely beautiful area. This is the beginning uh, of the uh, Pine Ledges Trail. So I highly recommend walking that, that area. It's a beautiful area. Um, uh, Worcester lot came from the estate of Benjamin Worcester. Benjamin Worcester was instrumental in the Swedenborgian community in Waltham. Swedenborgianism was an offshoot of Unitarianism and, and Universalism, um, and it had a very strong congregation um, in the Piety Corner area. The Clark family, very old Waltham family, the Sanderson family going back to the 1600s, they were all involved along with the Worcester family. Um, and so this is the house that Benjamin Worcester built for himself, um, a beautiful uh, 1854 Italianate, um, and it still stands. Um, it's a philosophy foundation now, um, and it's behind the Piety Corner Club that you can see on Worcester Lane. Um, he was also, Benjamin Worcester was also responsible for uh, getting this chapel built for the congregation, um, which you probably recognize from the corner of, of Bacon and Lexington and, and, and Cotton Pond Road. Um, and also he ran for many years the, the school that was connected with the Swedenborgian congregation um, in the same location. Um, and, and so this is, uh, pointers teasing out, anyway. This is the, uh, one of the buildings from that school. It's now Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall. Or Chauncey Hall Chapel Hill, I always get confused. Um, part of their, their campus. Um, okay, moving along, um, 1932, uh, the park boundary looked like this. Oh, I'm pointing back. Good. What was added was mainly these two lots up here. Um, and so that gave the park in the city the ability to put a road through from the southern end here all the way through to the northern end. Um, and, and a gate was formed here. Um, and also at that time, this is 1932, this is the 30s, this is the Great Depression. And so there were, there's a lot of work that was done in the park by crews associated with the ERA, the Emergency Relief Administration, which was one of President Roosevelt's alphabet soup. Of, of, of relief agencies from the Great Depression. And so a lot of things in the park date from then, and, and we'll see some of them. Uh, I also wanted to point back here at the summer house and say a couple words about that. Um, so first of all, the Barnes Woodlots were the ones that went through uh, up to Winter Street. Um, the Barnes family had their farm over on the eastern part of town on Warren Street. Um, Barnes married into the Warren family uh, in, in the 1830s. Um, and Thomas Barnes built this house uh, in 1837. Um, we now know it as a Regal Farms. Um, the Warren family had been farming that area since the, the 1650s at least. Um, so a very old part of town here. Um, the city has just recently bought a Regal Farms and we're in the process of trying to be able to preserve at least some of that house um, at this time but it's connected to the park because those were the Barnes woodlots. That's where they got the wood to build, <laughs> probably this house. Um, the northern end of the park um, now has, of course, Totten Pond Road coming across. Totten Pond Road actually cut off the very northern tip of the park. This is Winter Street back here, and that was the northern gate um, when the road was put through to Winter Street. And you can see here, it's hard, I know, but there's a, a stone pillar here and another stone pillar over here. So they're similar to the ones at the southern end, but these were built in the 1930s by the ERA crews. Um, and so they're wider. It's more for automobile traffic now, not horse and buggy uh, traffic. Uh, so that still exists, although you don't normally notice it on, on the other side of Cotton Pond Road. Um, these are the Boy, Stu Boy Scout lean-tos. They were built for the Boy Scouts. Um, uh, in, in 1934 by, again, ERA crews. 
Um, and we'll visit those hopefully on the walk. Um, this is a stone fireplace near those lean-tos, but actually associated with a campsite that was here from about 1920 until the 1950s. Overnight camping was allowed um, in the park. They had many, many beautiful campsites. The campsites, many of them are still there. Um, most of the fireplaces have been removed. Um, this, this stone fireplace we have documented from 1934 by ERA construction. Um, so I think all the other brick and stone ones possibly are from that period. Uh, I just hope the city documented those fireplaces well before they demolished them, which is recently been done. Um, okay, some other things you might see in the park um, that you can relate historically. Um, this is the Sunset Trail, what we call the Sunset Trail now. Um, and this is a circular stone artifact that sits off that trail. Um, and if you see it, I believe what that is, is where the old pump, well and pump, used to be. In the 1920s, this is from 1926, um, this picture here, and here's the pump here. It's a little hard to see, but it was a hand pump that went to a well. It was the only water supply for camping and so on in the park. Um, of course, well in the park today would be problematic from a health point of view, and so there is none in the park right now. But I think this is the site of that, um, although it's not functioning. Now, also, the road used to be called um, the Glen Road. Um, and, and what was called the Glen Road, we now call Sunset Trail. Um, summer House Shelter is interesting. The Summer House Shelter was originally built, that's this thing here, in, in, in 1895. Yeah. It was the earliest, the first shelter built in the park. Um, in 1934, there are records of the ERA crews repairing it, and of course, it's been repaired. The, the, the city's keeping it in good shape uh, now. Um, I wanted to point out this stone building behind. That stone building behind is, is various called uh, caretakers' cottage or, or tool shed and so on. Um, this stone structure was built in, in, in 1948. Um, it was built in 1948 to replace this wooden structure here, which dates from much earlier, and that was the caretaker's cottage. There actually was a summer caretaker who lived in the park during the summer um, back in, in those early days. Um, unfortunately, in, 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 so this was around 1930, this picture was taken by Sanderson again. Um, and and uh, in 1948, it burned down in a fire. So I think the lesson here is fires are extremely dangerous in the park. Um, and, and in fact, this is a picture from 1995 here. Uh, okay, moving on along. Um, this is a map from 1961 now. And of course, lots of changes. Here is 128 coming through here. Um, here is the city built out uh, to the park. Notice no cotton cotton road yet. Cotton Pond Road went out, went through right about this time. So this is just before Cotton Pond was gotten rid of and Cotton Pond Road uh, came through. Um, and at this time, the ski area includes the ski area, but the ski area was added in, in 1948. Um, and so that's here, the northern end. You can see it right out the window there. Um, this is what it looked like. Um, this is from a news article in 1975, I think, 1973, I can't read that. Um, anyway, the ski area functioned very well from 1949 to 1989, 40 wonderful years, very successful until the weather started changing and snowfall became so erratic that it really couldn't operate uh, anymore. Um, and so I point out here, uh, this trail here is the, the bar, the, the tow bar uh, that went up, um, takes skiers to the top, and we'll see that uh, on our walk now. Um, the, the, I, I might say that this area was sort of an odd ski area in the sense that the steeper um, slope was at the bottom, and the more gradual slope was at the top. So the beginners were at the top, and the advanced skiers <laughs> were, were at the bottom. Um, but it had two different uh, toes here, ski toes, one at, at the lower slope, which was the steep one, and then one at the upper slope. Um, and, and so this is, of course, you know, you need the slide. There it is, the ski area. Uh, today, um, this is what that lower uh, ski toe trail 
Uh, it looks like today you can actually see here, although it's hard in this picture, there's right here, there's a, a light pole that goes up, and we'll see one of those light poles on our trip uh, today. Is that a rock wall on the right? This is, these are rocks, but it's not a colonial rock wall. I'm pretty sure the bulldozers just pushed that to the side when they made the, uh, the ski slope. It doesn't conform to any of the colonial land grants, and, and the rocks are much bigger. There's no, I don't think it's a colonial wall. It's actually on the aerial survey, but uh, not, not a, uh, a colonial wall. This is the, the um, operator's hut uh, at the top of the lower ski lift, um, which we might get a look at today. Um, this is the hut at the top of the upper um, uh, ski tote, um, which we will definitely get a look at today, so you know what they are when you go by them. Um, I want to talk about, very briefly, the southern end of the park and the latest edition, this edition from 2016, um, is the Berry Park uh, edition. And, and um, so this is a little closer map of the Berry Park edition. Um, and it's got some very interesting features. First of all, it's got a number of these colonial stone walls in it. Um, between Now this is, remember, in, the, in lieu of township lots. So the lots are smaller than the ones up at the Great Dividend. Um, but again, this is a squadron line from the lieu of township lots. And there's a nice stone wall along it. This is one of the lot lines here, a nice stone wall along it. This stone wall here, I'm not sure what it is. Um, there was some agriculture that was practiced at the very southern end of the park, and so it might be related to that. Um, a. Hunberry uh, is the guy who it's named after, and, and he bought up all this property eventually. There were two houses that were originally built off Lunda Street here, um, about here and here, in the mid-1800s. Um, and, and those houses are now gone. You can see their foundations or sort of where they were if you walk in along these paths. But Barry bought one of the houses eventually, or wiped it, and, 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 um, and then established a, a, a greenhouse here, about here, and, and also a windmill uh, to pump water for his large. I think he had some sheep too, possibly, um, up there. And so the, um, also another uh, private uh, group here, um, the Prospect Hill Park Advocacy Group in the 1990s pushed for improvements uh, in the park. Possibly as a result of that, um, in 1997, there was a city-sponsored planning process for the park. Um, and the trouble is, when the city went out to get money from the state to implement these things, they ran into that problem from having put the water tanks in illegally in 1975. Um, and so presumably, that was taken care of. But, but it did cause some problems at that time. Um, so a lot of, of improvements in the park were made, uh, or some at least, were made from, from, from this uh, master plan. And in fact, the recreation uh, board uh, and the department are in the process now um, of, of coming up with a new um, plan, overall plan, for, for the park, for improvements in the park. So if you have something you want to say, now's a good time to contact the rec department rec board about it. Okay, just a plug for the uh, Prospect Hill Park stewards. Um, as I say, we go around, clean up stuff, take out um, uh, plants that shouldn't be there, and, and, and help people who are lost in the park and so on. Um, and we're always looking for new volunteers. So if you want to become a park steward, uh, please see me at some point. And I'll give you more information. Um, Waltham Historical Commission. Uh, the commission has sponsored a lot of the surveys of the stone walls. Um, if you go to the commission website, this is what it looks like. It's part of the city's website. Um, and down here you can see um, we've got historic maps there, historic information, um, stone wall locations throughout Waltham. So those are a bunch of interactive maps that show you where these stone walls are, including this map here, but in fact with photo points uh, on the maps. Um, and also down here, the old stone walls of Prospect Hill Park. That's a report I wrote a few years ago uh, of the history. It's, it's actually a field guide to the stone walls you'll see out in the park. So if you're interested, go to the website. It's free. You can download it. Um, our walk to